Okay, super, we are recording. So um, from now, that was the nice chit chat over with. Now I will um, start scouring my screen and we'll go from there. So what we're going to do is we're just going to talk a little bit about the theory of hair analysis in practice. My name's Karen, I'm the practitioner at Mineral Check. Um, I do put my contact details up at the end. So if you haven't spoken to me before, you've now got my phone number, but you'll also get my email. As we go through, if you want to ask a question, feel free to put your hand up or just interrupt me by turning your mute button off. I'm absolutely happy with that. Um, bear with me, I'm just turning my phone on to silence so it doesn't keep looping. Okay. So Mineral Check represents an American lab, Trace Elements, here in the UK. We've been working with them for over, over 18 years now. The lab has been going for about 24 years. Our director of research at the lab is Dr. David Watts. I've had the good luck to be working with him ever since I joined. He's published over 50 different scientific papers on hair analysis and minerals themselves. He's been a great resource and he's just someone really rather wonderful to be able to share with. He's written a book, Trace Elements and Other Essential Nutrients. And very often people during seminars will ask me for reading material and I always recommend that book. It was the book that David told me to read when I started. I joined Mineral Check. I didn't know a great deal about hair analysis. I, um, it was one of those chance interviews, um, you know, one of those happy life events where I turned up for the interview and then just shrugged my shoulders and said, well, the job sounds great, but I don't know anything about hair analysis. And the director that was interviewing me said, never mind, Karen, we can teach you that. So I began to work with David and every time I asked a question, he said, look in my book, look in my book. And I realized I'd progressed a lot when he actually answered one of my questions. So um, the cost of the test and turnaround time, let's do the practicals. I love it because it's actually quite an inexpensive test. This is actually an old slide, which I should have changed, but the trade price of the test has changed slightly. As student practitioners, you are all able to access it at the trade price. It's now £46 for profile two. That includes a graph of all of the results and an interpretation report, which explains what it means. I would stress that nobody here at Mineral Check expects someone who's done their first test or even their second test to understand a test result immediately. When we started the company, we felt really strongly that you should be able to call up and ask for technical support. It's really for me in particular. I was a new graduate when I started and I just really wanted people to, to be able to explain the test results. I wanted to give the kind of service that I wanted when I phoned a lab. So that's really how we work here. We're always happy to talk through test results. For those of you that haven't seen a hair analysis, up on the screen is a sample test report um, of Susie. Um, you can see Susie's minerals are quite low. She's got quite a lot of toxic elements showing and she's got some really interesting um, additional elements. And so this is how the results will be presented so that you can see them just like that, nicely, clearly. When people first look at them, they get excited because they'll go, oh, Susie's got a lot of toxic elements. And yep, she has. But as we go through today, what I'm hoping your first thing is when you look at Susie, oh, everything in the blue box is incredibly low. They are her main nutrient minerals, and those are the ones that are going to drive the imbalances. I think of a hair analysis and the minerals as pretty much like looking at the foundations of a house or building or because they are the foundations of a person. If your mineral levels are too low, then testing downstream for things like SIBO, histamine intolerance, all of the, if you like, the buzzwords in the field at the moment, yes, all of that's very, very relevant, but actually you won't correct it unless the mineral balance is correct. And very often, if you can get the mineral balance correct, you will find those other issues do not need as much work. A while ago, I did, um, I had some histamine testing, a practitioner I was working with a lot, 
Jan had a lab, she had a lab that would do histamine testing, uh, not histamine, um, homocysteine testing for £12 test. It was a private lab, you had to go there and have the blood drawn and they would do the homocysteine test. And so we came up with an idea that we would, she's a very busy practitioner, she was a very engaging practitioner. Her clients loved working with her. And so she basically asked a few of them if they would mind having their homocysteine test, tested. And they went along to the lab and it was near Durham. And they had their blood drawn and she got the homocysteine results. Then she did not work on those test results. She just filed them. She worked on their mineral balance. And then six months later, retested the homocysteine. And what we found in every single case, the homocysteine had normalized as the mineral balance changed. Now, I found that fascinating because conventional nutritional therapy textbook wisdom would be that in homocysteine, you do X, Y, Z. And she hadn't done any of that. She actually just worked on things like this test, for example, Susie shows that there's a very low calcium magnesium level. She'd worked on that. It shows a very low copper level. She'd worked on that. Shows very low phosphorus. She would work on that. Very low manganese, very low chromium, very low selenium. She would work on those issues. And that corrected her home, the homocysteine levels, which I found completely fascinating. It was um, one of the things that really started to convince me that I always call it the downstream testing, that we can do a lot of testing, but if we don't get this basis right, then I think that the changes we can make as practitioners often don't hold. And so in six months time, the client comes back not feeling so well. One of the things that you'll find when I talk about test results, I talk a lot about the significant ratios, and that's the reverse of the graph that shows the results. So we've got the little box at the top and I'm going to talk through the significant ratios today. And then when we look at an actual test result and talk through that with Sue, we will talk a bit more in detail about those. Um, we've got the toxic ratios Just, box. Yeah, was that a question? No, sorry. Okay, that's fine. Don't worry. Um, so we've got the toxic ratio box here. And what we need from the toxic ratios is we'd like them all to be at the top. So if we look at iron and mercury, which is the third one in, iron and mercury, all of the toxic ratios should be like that. And what that means is there is enough of the nutritional element to balance the toxic element. That's all it means. And so if we look at Susie's iron to lead and her calcium to lead, we can see she doesn't have enough calcium and she doesn't have enough iron to balance the lead. If we go back a page, we can see there's very little lead showing at all. The problem is the calcium and the iron are so low, they wouldn't balance any lead that was coming in. So that's really um, a very, very quick overview. Don't worry too much about notes. I will be, um, I've got a great little handout for everyone that comes along or listens to the recording. Um, and I'll show you where to pick that up from and it'll cover a lot what we're talking about. Um, so let's go back a step. How's the testing actually done? It's an ISP mass spectrometry machine. And what that means is the hair goes into the, the lab, it's popped into a test tube, it's, if you like, dissolved. And the mass spectrometry machine, each mineral goes off a light level. The machine will read that light level and that will give you the levels that we report. The lab has very, very strict quality control processes in place. It is a licensed lab in the States. It's regulated and it's regularly inspected by the FDA Food and Drinks Administration. So it has to meet extremely high standards and it has to be licensed under the Clinical Laboratories Improvements Act. And that act sets out the guidelines for the laboratory's testing, its reliability, it sets out standards of good practice. And then the lab is regularly inspected to make sure it's meeting those. I put a little thing here about spike sample recovery. And what that means is every so often, the lab will deliberately contaminate a sample. It'll choose a sample to deliberately contaminate that we have a lot of. And it's just to check that the machine is reading correctly. Also, if we're sent a very large sample, which some people do, we'll divide it into two and test both 
so that we can make sure the machine is reading correctly. And every 12th sample is in fact a sample that we know the results for. And we know the results for that because it's um, the lab bulk buys hair from Japan, it's human hair, and it's been cut and sold specifically for this purpose. The hair is cut, tested, the results are then supplied with the hair. So the lab will test the hair, a sample of, make sure it meets the control. And then every 12th sample is a sample of this Japanese hair and the machine is reading it to make sure that it is what it should find. That's how we know and we can test for accuracy. Um, a lot of people ask how I first got into this. So this is the first test I ever did. Um, the eagle eyed amongst you will spot it didn't look anything like Susie. This is in fact a, a test result for a horse called Apache, that was my horse. I tested the horse because I attended a seminar, pretty much like you're doing today, was absolutely fascinated by it and decided, kind of a little bit of a joke in this industry, which I'm sure you've heard of, is that we tend to practice on our partners, our children and our animals before having a go on ourselves. And I tested my horse. Um, one of the things that you will see is this horse test is extremely high in aluminium. Aluminium is the most abundant element in the Earth's crust. So as a contaminant, it's very common in animals. And if iron status is good, then the aluminium should not prove a problem. There is some super research done at the late 80s on young offenders and aluminium was found to be a problem for the most of the cohort that was being tested. I'm trying to remember the name of the scientist now that I that did that research, forgotten it. Um, anyway, so Apache was the first test I actually did. Um, and actually he was how I got into this field because I began to rat, ring the lab for advice. They didn't have anyone who could answer my questions. And I jokingly said, perhaps I should send you my CV. And five days later, the office manager rang up and said, your CV didn't arrive. I was like, mm, that was a throwaway comment. And just, ah, throwaway comment. It might have been, I suggest you write the CV. One of the directors wants to meet you. So I sent my CV in and ended up working in this field, which is where I've been since I graduated, although I do work in practice as well. Um, for humans, I thought I'd put a little bit of aluminium in. For humans, um, it's aluminium is commonly found in deodorants, body lotions, soaps, it's found in water softeners, in salt, it's in baking powder, because it helps all of those things run through machinery very easily. It's found in um, cigarette smoke, some medications. Water is cleaned with aluminium. The aluminium is then filtered back out, but traces of it do remain. So it's really quite a common one to come across. Um, plants that grow in an aluminium silicate rich substrate i.e. soil, have a protective measure that stops them absorbing the aluminium. So the plant can grow in the soil, it doesn't absorb the aluminium, and we can eat the plant without ingesting that aluminium. Dr. Neil Ward at the University of Surrey has done some really interesting research on plants growing alongside the M25. And what he found was that in a highly acidic environment, and therefore to the plants, a highly stressful environment. The mechanism that stops them avoiding uh, absorbing the aluminium breaks down. Now, there's no research on humans, but I think if that can happen in plants, I don't think that I'm making a huge leap when I say potentially, therefore, in a highly stressed and acidic environment for a person, that we also could start to absorb aluminium. And one of the other ways that humans will absorb aluminium is via the iron transport mechanism. We have a, a component called transferrin that moves iron around the body. And I always think of transferrin as being like a little disc because the iron sits in the middle. If there is insufficient iron, the body will use transferrin to move the next chemically similar thing because transferrin can only move around the body if it has got something in the center where it's designed to carry the iron. If it doesn't have iron, it'll move the next chemically similar thing, which is aluminium. And here's where it gets really interesting. 
the body has different gatekeepers, which should prevent the absorption of toxic elements. So if you like, and I'm being very anthropomorphic here, but bear with me, the gatekeeper sees transferrin and goes, oh, okay, in you go. It doesn't look to see what is on the transferrin molecule. So the transferrin molecules comes in and it's carrying not iron, but aluminium because there was a shortage of iron. But the body is giving that molecule free access to all areas because it's recognizing the carrier, not what it's carrying. And then once we start to absorb the aluminium, it can go on to wreak further havoc. That's a very simplistic and very anthropomorphic explanation. But I think hopefully that helps you get how we start to absorb aluminium. And the principle is the same for all the other toxic elements. Uh, a little bit about aluminium there. I will share the slides. So how do these things get into the hair? Well, here we have a cross section of a hair cell. When the hair is growing under the scalp, it is exposed to the intracellular tissues and fluids. And those are the ones that are carrying the mineral pattern. So the hair is being, if you like, bathed in something. As the hair shaft grows out, it hardens and preserves that pattern. An ideal sample is about three to four centimeters long. You take it with scissors, you take it from the back of the hair. I do get asked a lot about whether you can test other tissues and the answer is yes, you can. You can test fingernails, you can test chest hair, you can test pubic hair, but think about the growth physiology. A pubic hair sample or a body hair sample grows for a certain length of time, hangs around for a while and then drops out. So if you test body hair, you don't know how old the pattern you're looking at is. If you test your fingernails, they've taken a while to grow out. Um, quite a while. I recently had a running injury and damaged some toenails quite badly. And I was astonished at how long it actually took for the nail to grow out and the new nail to grow to the point it could be cut. You're looking at a very old pattern. And therefore I would only use other body hair or fingernails or toenails for looking for toxic elements. I would never use it for the mineral pattern other than to make sweeping generalizations. Oh, X is low, Y is high, very sweeping. Um, I do get asked a lot about men who have very short hair or claim to have no hair. And mostly what I find when I question the men about that is they're using clippers. Um, my partner has extraordinary short hair. He uses clippers all the time to keep it short. Um, in order to test his hair, I just let it tend to let it grow till it's a bit untidy and then cut the sample and tidy it up with clippers. So the sample will be very short. The sample is weight dependent and we do, oh, I haven't got one handy. We do provide with each test kit um, a little fulcrum. So it's a piece of card, folds up to make a little seesaw so that you can weigh the hair so that you know you're sending sufficient. Um, what can contaminate the hair or externally influence it? We always say use undyed hair. Now, I know that's a bit of a, a bit of a fetch here because most women dye their hair or highlight it. And the point is it, that doesn't really matter. Um, the problem with dyes is if you have a very heavily bleached hair, it theoretically can upset the calcium magnesium or the calcium balance. I've worked in this field for 20 years I do not think that light bleaching of the hair prior to applying a blonde highlight or a blonde dye actually affects the hair. And so with my own clients, I always say, go ahead and test. The dyes that do affect the results are blackening ones. So African ones, Indian ones that are sold in markets that dye the hair black often contain lead. And there are some commercial products that are available, things like Grecian 2000. They will darken the hair by applying lead. So you're applying lead to the scalp, you're using it in a warm environment, so you're opening the pores, so it's highly likely that the body will absorb them. Um, perming can artificially elevate magnesium. Just make sure if someone's perming their hair that they're washing it regularly. The one that I'm always very, very cautious of is shampoo. 
99% of all shampoos are absolutely fine, but head and shoulders or an anti-dandruff shampoo can affect zinc levels or selenium levels, depending upon which shampoo it is. Head and shoulders will affect zinc levels. So if you have a client that's using a medicated shampoo like that, then I would suggest that they change to a more natural product. There are lots of things you can use. Jason's make an anti-dandruff shampoo, um, which uses zinc. So again, can't, don't think automatically, oh, I've got a natural product, it's good, because Jason's is very heavily zinc based. But you can use things like um, a brand I recommend a lot are uh, Earth Friendly, the baby shampoo or Salcura. And if someone's really worried about the um, shampoo, a couple of drops of grapefruit seed extract will often just solve that problem. Um, and it'll usually clear it up so they don't need to go back to their very harsh shampoos anyway. If someone's swimming a lot, particularly in um, Scotland, copper sulfite is a very common thing to use to clean swimming pools. So if you ever see an extremely high copper level and the person is swimming a lot, um, a quick call to the pool that they're using to find out if they use copper sulfate to clean the water is um, called for, I think, just to, so that you know if it's an external contaminant. Now I've put a slide up here. Um, this is Gordon and I know it's an old test and I know it's not particularly clear, but the reason I put it up was I wanted you to see how very obvious an external contaminant is. So if you have a look in his toxic minerals, you can see his lead is extraordinarily high. It goes off the chart. If you look down in additional minerals, roughly in the middle, titanium is also off the chart, extraordinarily high. When we get a result that's, um, this is actually a retest, which is why there are two rows of figures. The top row of figures is the current, the row underneath is the original. So that's how we'll present it. So you've got a very quick comparison there. And if you ever want a retest done, you just supply the lab number and we do it like this. Gordon um, went to see a practitioner. She's a very good friend of mine. Um, we always call if there's a really quirky result. So we called and said, titanium and lead are off the scale. They're clearly external contaminants. Can you talk to your client? He denied that he was using Grecian 2000. He denied all sorts of things. So she went ahead and did a detox protocol. She retested to him. Seven months later, they were still off the scale. She rang me and said, well, what do I do? And when I talked to her about what she'd done, I mean, I thought I did big supplement programs sometimes. She had completely overhauled his diet and she had got him on what I can only describe as a carry bag full of supplements. So my view was that had to be an external contaminant. He turned up for the consultation with his wife in tow so that she could be totally appraised of his dietary needs. That should act as a slight red flag for you. And um, the practitioner asked if he dyed his hair if, and he immediately denied it. And his wife interjected with, oh, don't be so vain, tell her the truth. And it turned out he was using Grecian 2000. So you get that extraordinarily high lead level. Now I have to say the consultation went downhill because feeling she was on a bit of a roll and he'd already been ratted out over the dye, she asked him about the titanium and it turned out he was using a titanium is a vasodilator. So I'm kind of, yes, I'm looking at the camera and I can tell that Sue has already worked it out. Titanium is a vasodilator, so it will work something like Viagra. And he was using a herbal product to improve his sex drive, which his wife didn't know. And the practitioner rang me later and said, that was the worst consultation I've ever done. They had a domestic in it and they'd left. They didn't pay me. And I was in absolute stitches about it. And um, he has in fact been back. He does know that I tell this story in um, seminars, um, as does the practitioner and both laugh about it now. But um, yeah, you can't always rely on your clients to tell the truth at the outset. Um, so why would we test the hair? Why do we do that? Well, it's a screening test. It gives us a general overview. It's safe and it's non-invasive. And I think the safe and the non-invasive is really important, particularly if you're working with um, children. You can test urine and you can test blood. Um, urine is very inconvenient. You can test urine for the toxic elements. So you take a challenge, it's called a challenge, and that would theoretically drive a toxic element out. Very difficult to know exactly what's going on if you do that. 
because you don't really know what's being stored, you don't know about the nutritional elements, you don't really know what's going on there. Um, or you can use blood testing and spend a lot of time explaining blood testing to practitioners. I'm going to use calcium as my example here. The body has what's called a homeostatic range for calcium. It will keep it within that very, very tight range. If it goes too high or too low, respiratory distress can occur or muscular problems can occur. And the muscular problem is key because, of course, think about the heart muscle. So calcium, very, very tight range. And the blood will protect that at all costs. The tissues, that's storage material. You can do what you like there. So the blood is often not as accurate for your minerals as your tissue. Blood is accurate if there's an exposure to a heavy metal going on, it will show up if the exposure is high. Um, and I've put this little slide up about, it's an old study, 1972. Um, there were cows, they were given 300 parts per million cadmium in their drinking water. 300 parts per million is an incredibly low dose. Um, they had an intake of 4.5 milligrams over 12 weeks. Again, a very low dose. Testing their blood, the cadmium never showed at all. But in four weeks, so it only took four weeks, their levels in the liver, the kidneys and the hair were all reflective of each other and the peak levels were reached, but it took four weeks to reach that high level and then it maintained at that level. What that tells us is that the hair is a very good indicator of what's going on in other body tissues. And I always make the point, it's a screening test and we've tested hair, but we're using that to extrapolate out as to what might be going in the on in the body. And the research does indicate that that would be an appropriate way forward. I put here, keep it real. It is a screening tool, it's not diagnostic. Be aware that you are only testing hair. So you are making a assumption, not a diagnosis. And there are some quirks. Hair testing is used for drinks and drug problems. In the United States, if you are in the state of Arizona and you're caught driving under the influence of alcohol, you will lose your license or you can agree to abstain from all alcohol for a predetermined period. And I think it's between one and three years. And what the state does is then every three months you go along and you have your hair measured to see if there is an alcohol metabolite in the hair. And if there is, then you promptly do use your license. But if you have abstained as per your court order, you do not lose your license. So the science is really well um, established. It's also used for looking for drunk, um, drug issues um, in people. Um, the NHS actually test hair. Uh, they test for drug metabolites, but they also can test for toxic elements as well. And Mineral Check does actually test for a hospital in Wales because we were cheaper than their local NHS lab. And that for me has always been a bit of a dichotomy because you send um, practitioners will phone up and say, oh, the client took it off to um, the doctor and the doctor didn't believe. And then um, later that day, we'll get samples from a hospital in Wales. And it's like, yeah, I just don't think we all talk to each other sometimes. Um, but as a lab, all we specialise in is the mineral testing. Um, the phosphorus level will often give you an indication about um, eating disorders, which is why I put the anorexic there. Um, now, if you go on the lab internet and you do a search, you'll find that there are sites that say you can test for parasites or food intolerance in the hair, and you can't. It's as simple as that. The science doesn't support it. It's farty woo woo. That is not an established scientific method. It's done by a, an acupuncture vole dowsing machine. Um, I'm not opposed to dowsing. I've been known to douse myself, but I don't only tend to do it with certain clients and I will only douse in certain situations. I wouldn't douse and then pretend it was a lab test. I wouldn't douse things. I think my, my answer is always, you know, if it was my child and this hair test said it was safe for them to eat peanuts, would I let them have peanuts, even though I know they have a nut allergy? And the answer is no. I wouldn't. And I tend to view things like that. It isn't possible in a lab, uh, a hair test for food intolerances or parasites. It just isn't. Um, and I wanted you all to be really clear on that. 
Um, as per test in clinic, I tend to do it with most of my clients. That's probably because I'm really used to it. What you'll see when we go through the set of test results in a moment is you get a good look at the adrenals, the immunity, the thyroid, state of mind, and their toxic elements. The report will give you a clue about what it all means and what to do. Now, follow-ups. When do you do a follow-up if you've done the initial test? A really great question. You can do the follow-up anytime. <coughs> I always say, pick your testing, retesting interval according to what someone's done. So um, for a while, we had a woman working with us here in the office just doing admin. Her name was also Karen, which caused loads of confusion when people phoned, but her name was Karen. And um, she worked here, so she gets her hair tested and she tests her hair. And I spoke to her about the results and she decided she would only do one thing. And that was to add some apple cider vinegar to her drinking water before a meal. She did that for two days and then decided it just didn't taste great, so she wouldn't do that anymore. And 10 months later, we retested her hair and the results were virtually identical. She worked with us for about three years. Her results never changed because she never did anything different. Um, if your client will change their diet, make some lifestyle changes and take supplements, then I think you can reasonably test in three months three to four months, because you've got a lot of changes going on. And I think it's quite motivating for people to start to see the results. And also it helps you tailor the program. If you're not getting the changes you expect, you can tweak. Um, maybe every five, six months, if they only change the diet every six months, your, your testing interval is very much based on what people will change. Put a little note here about the results, they're in parts per million. Um, I will share the slides because if your client comes to you with um, results from another lab that has reported it in parts per million as opposed to milligram percent, you do need to know how to, and then you can use the slides that follow. Um, so um, we use milligram percent. If you had 180 parts per million, that would be 18 milligram percent. So we are using much smaller figures, makes it just a lot nicer. I wanted to have a look at the results for a real person. And this is Sue, who has kindly agreed that we can use her results. So um, I'm going to ask if she wants to chip in and talk through it when I talk as well, but I'm going to talk through the results initially. And I'm sure you're going to have lots of questions. So when I look at a test result, the first thing I will look at is this box, the nutritional elements. So it's sort of a bluey, purpley color. And I'll look through it and I'll just kind of clock certain things. We've got quite an elevated calcium, the magnesium's a bit low, sodium, potassium are quite low. I'm gonna be interested in a minute to talk about the ratio of those. Her copper's low too, not great. I'm not seeing the, um, the test results. I'm still on the last slide. Ah, okay. I don't know about anyone else, but right, <laughs> hang on. Uh, Nikki can't even. Does it yeah, work? Yeah, I'm the same. Oh, here we are. Yeah, that's better. Got yeah. it. Yeah, thanks. Super. Thank you for that. Right. Okay. So, Sue, um, I was just talking through that. We've got um, looking at first thing I'm going to look at is the nutritional elements. Um, I'm seeing calcium, top end of reference range. The rest of it, not bad but not great. Um, I've clocked that the manganese is extremely low, so that's interesting. Her molybdenum's low, her sulfur's low. I've looked at the toxic elements. Interesting. We've got uranium, arsenic, beryllium, mercury, and aluminium. All are showing, but all at very low levels. Interesting. Um, I scrolled down and I'm hoping you can see that I've scrolled down and we've got the additional elements. Again, they're all quite low. And then we've got the significant ratios. Now those I find really interesting. This is where I will, I'm just looking for something because I want to use it. No, nope, can't find it. Okay, um, here we've got her calcium phosphorus is the first one at 7.5. Her sodium potassium is one. Her calcium potassium is 21. Zinc to copper, 10.7. Sodium magnesium, 1.14. Calcium magnesium, very high, 23.86. 
her iron to copper one. That's interesting because that's where I'm now going to make put some of my thoughts. But before I go any further, I want to have a look at her toxic metal works. That's interesting too. Her selenium to mercury is too low. Her zinc to mercury is too low as well. Go back up. Let's just check her mercury level is 0.05. Now, we have a very big reference range for mercury. Go back to your maths and remember the bell curve um, in statistics. One end is low, one end is gonna be high, and the majority is gonna be in the middle. And because this is a screening test, it's not like a diagnostic test. So if we take thyroid testing, um, and I know it's fraught, but wear with me. Um, Anything under for a thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH, anything over two, the um, medical profession will say that you should medicate. Over two, it is a hypothyroid situation. It, that's click up. It's a diagnostic test. This is a screening test. So we have to use that bell curve. What's high, what's low, what's in the middle? We find a lot of mercury. So we have a big reference range. So 0 0.05 looks on the low side, but actually I think anything over 0.10 is high mercury. So Sue is well on the way to being high mercury. So what's, if I scroll back down, her calcium phosphorus levels suggest to me that A, she's going to be a slow metabolizer. And I don't have loads of time to cover that here, but I will come on to how you can find out a little bit more about metabolism. But it does tell me there's an issue using calcium and phosphorus. So I would just scroll back up and I see she's 59. So I would be interested here in talking to her about bone health at some point and just getting her calcium properly utilized. Because if I look at her calcium magnesium and her calcium potassium ratios, I can see they are both very high too. So if we go back up now, and we look at her calcium level, it's not very high, but it's high in proportion to the other nutritional elements. So this is beginning to give me some clues. High calcium happens for four main reasons. It happens because of a shortage of hydrochloric acid. Just file that one. I'm going to come back to that. It happens because of a lack of vitamin C, E or B6. Hmm, that's interesting. File that one. It happens because of a lack of magnesium and manganese. Let's just go back. We can see her, manganese, her magnesium is low to calcium, so we know that applies. We can see her manganese is very low, so we know that applies. And it happens if someone's hypothyroid. Now, hypothyroid, either clinical or subclinical. She may be hypothyroid, that may have been diagnosed or she may have trouble picking up her thyroid hormones. And that will happen if the potassium is low. And that potassium is actually quite low at five. Now, potassium is really interesting because potassium is controlled by the adrenal glands. And potassium is what helps the body transport the thyroid hormones and the adrenal hormones and even insulin across the cell wall. So would suggest here that there is a problem with the body picking up the adrenal hormones and the thyroid hormones. So I would expect symptoms of brain fog, fatigue, energy under par to be coming in. I would expect this person to have quite sustained endurance, but not to feel very vibrant. Um, I hope that's OK. I've put that there. I hope that's OK. Um, and so sodium and potassium are both controlled by the adrenals. As I say, if I look at the sodium potassium ratio, I can see it's down at one. That tells me that there has been a significant amount of stress and that the body hasn't recovered from it. Now, only by talking to the person will I actually uncover whether that is historic stress the body has not dealt with or current stress. It may be both. And this is where we branch out into really the adrenals 
we're not counsellors, but the adrenals are what are going to help motivate and mediate stress. If they are under functioning, then the body isn't going to be full of vitality, but equally, it's not going to meet the stress. If you think about, I often think about stress as a stress bucket. If it's over full, unless someone empties it, gives it a good clean, it doesn't get the opportunity to refill. And so here we need to look at how we can support the adrenals to bring them back to optimal health. And the sodium magnesium at 1.14, that's on the floor. That's really telling me that vitality and energy are really run down. This is stress that's going into resistance. And I'm expecting, and this is why it's really difficult actually, because I'm expecting this person to be really tired, but equally I know this person is a, a practitioner and she's studying nutrition, and I know she's terribly enthusiastic about what she's doing. So her diet may well be compensating for a lot of this. And I do have to bear that in mind. But nevertheless, I can see here that we need significant adrenal support. When the adrenals are in fight flight, um, you remember the old saber tooth tiger around the corner. So the body will switch off digestion. If the body switched off digestion, there's not going to be enough hydrochloric acid around. Hydrochloric acid is one of the things that helps calcium be properly utilized. So remember when I was going through my four reasons that calcium elevates. And I said, I think there's a shortage of HCL. I'll come back to that. Here, I've got my confirmation that actually the stress has been sustained and ongoing. And I think in terms of digestive support, we would need to put hydrochloric acid in. Or if she doesn't wish to use hydrochloric acid, talk about bitter foods and having bitter foods at every meal and talk about how to really get those in. Um, and here I'm thinking of things like endive, rocket, gourds, um, lemon juice, um, bitter squashes, things like that, mixing them up, dandelion leaves, anything that is bitter, perhaps using some um, black dandelion coffee, things like that that will support the liver as well can be really helpful. Um, the calcium potassium ratio is very elevated, which again, this is its tendency to hypothyroidism. Um, the zinc copper ratio is actually not too bad. That, that one's good. Um, here, so I'm going to go back because I've said zinc copper ratio is not too bad. What I want to make sure, therefore, is the ratio is good, but what are the zinc and copper levels looking like? And, um, you know, they're not fantastic. 1.4, it's quite low for copper. I would like to see it a little bit higher. Copper is a main driver for the immune system. And when copper is low or getting down to around one, the immune system often cannot mediate a response. So particularly now in a pandemic, I, I, in winter, bugs and flu and things going around, our inclination is to take a lot of vitamin C. And that is absolutely fine. The problem is when copper is down at 1.4, the vitamin C will lower the copper. If we drive the copper down any further, the body won't make an immune response. So we're taking the vitamin C because we want to stave off colds and infections. And very often, and I do find this at work quite a bit when I talk to people, they've been taking high doses of vitamin C and don't understand why they're getting the snuffles and colds and fluey things and a bit of a virus. And so we have a look at the copper level and that's where we find it low. And that's where we think that we need to start working on getting the copper up. So we might drop the vitamin C down to an absolute minimum while we get copper up, because that's one thing that will start to um, drive the immune system forward. The zinc level, the zinc level is interesting. Um, it looks okay. But because I know that there's a very marked and a long-term stressor present, I would be thinking about B6 because B6 is the first nutrient that's used up in the stress response along with magnesium. And so I would be thinking, I wonder if that zinc is genuine or if there's a shortage of B6 in the, in, in the system here and whether that zinc's not being used. I don't know for sure about that, but I would be, it would be one thing I was thinking of. It wouldn't be my immediate must go to, but I would certainly have that at the back of my mind. The manganese level is very low. I want to do a little bit on manganese in a minute. 
um, and that I'll do it now. Manganese is the main driver for energy and it's low. It will support blood sugar. It has so many uses in the system. It's a mineral we tend not to think about. It, I tend to think of it as an energy driver. It's low. I would therefore expect there to be energy problems and potentially some inflammation going on. Chromium levels and selenium levels are okay. Um, I'm just going back to the ratios because I want to pull up that calcium magnesium ratio. And then I'm going to ask Sue if she'd like to come in and say anything. The calcium magnesium ratio is extremely elevated. That tells me that Sue has a problem with balancing her blood sugar levels. She may be managing those brilliantly by diet, but there is an underlying blood sugar problem that isn't going away. Calcium promotes the release of insulin from the pancreas and magnesium helps switch that off. And equally, what we've got therefore is a very trigger happy insulin response. And this can be managed brilliantly with diet. And very often I talk to practitioners about it and they have these great diets and they don't have blood sugar problems. But when I point this out and say underlyingly there is, that's when they'll come back and go, do you know what? You're absolutely right. I am having trouble with my blood sugar balance, but I've got a great diet and, 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 and I'm doing this and I never touch this and I never touch that. And so it's controlled. But the, the tendency is there. And it's one of those, you know, have a glass of wine and a pizza tomorrow night just because, you know, it's whatever, uh, an occasion and your son's turned up with it and you want to share. And that's when you find that the whole blood sugar goes spiraling out of control and you start craving more wine, more chocolate, you want the ice cream. And it, it links to the potassium. The potassium is what's going to help get the insulin across the cell wall. We've got low potassium, so we've got a trigger happy insulin response. The calcium magnesium imbalance is giving us a permeable cell membrane. And we have therefore a really big potential blood sugar problem. Um, iron copper ratio, that's actually very good. Um, that's fine. Um, so we're good on that. Um, toxic elements, as I said, I'd like to see a little bit more selenium and I'd like to see a little more zinc. Um, if I scroll back up, the zinc and selenium, they're not bad, but I'd like to see them better. Um, I think of this often, uh, this area as a reservoir. If we have a really strong reservoir, we can meet the challenges that face us. Here, I would be looking at a protocol, therefore, of magnesium and B6. I'd be looking at copper-rich foods in the diet. I'd be looking at supplementing hydrochloric acid. Um, I'd be looking at bit or bitter foods. Um, I'd be talking about molybdenum and getting that up. It's subject to symptoms. And actually in this case, I think I probably would use something like Biocare do a Nutrisorb range and Vitasorb. And the liquid molybdenum is absolutely super. Only need one drop. You can drop it into some water or a smoothie or, or, or just drop it onto breakfast. Fantastic for getting the molybdenum up really, really quickly. I'd be talking about sulfur rich foods because all of the products that the body wishes to detoxify, be it hormones or toxic elements, or just residue bind to sulfur to be carried out of the body and molybdenum drives that sulfur reaction. So I would be thinking about putting that in. I'd be talking about some copper rich foods. Um, now the zinc is interesting. I think that zinc and the manganese need to come up a little bit, but I don't want to lower copper. So my first focus for the first three months would be copper rich foods. And I would talk a lot about nuts and seeds and how we can get those into the diet and dark chocolate, things like that, that are really copper rich, um, just to get that copper up. Now we are in the really fortunate position of having the person who test this is in. So I'm gonna ask Sue to unmute herself and then I'd love you to come in and make some comments because I know we've talked through your test result and I know you're working on things. And do you have any questions first? Let's start there. Do you have any questions? Oh, where to start? <laughs> Um, I have started back on HCL, B6. Um, I know I've had an issue with copper before because I've had other testing done 
I had a note test a couple of years ago, which highlighted a copper issue then. Uh, I did supplement it for a couple of months. Um, blood sugar, definitely. I, I struggle hugely with maintaining my blood sugars. And if I have anything that tips me, then I can spend a week or so craving something. So this time of year is really quite hard for me because of course there's lots of things like mince pies that come out. <laughs> um, the issue with calcium may be because I supplemented really heavily with vitamin D <clears throat> most of this year. I've stopped in the last six weeks since getting this result. Um, and I wasn't supplementing with K2, so I'm not sure whether that might have caused an issue with too much calcium being around. I'm not aware of there being a bone issue. I have had, um, I haven't had a, a bone scan, but I have recently had a check with my osteopath to see what my, um, potential for osteoporosis is and that, and that wasn't a risk however I have I have had a, an early menopause so that I'm 32 so that would be 27 years ago so that certainly is a huge risk I'm very hypothyroid as you could probably hear I'm a bit croaky um, my TSH is always bang on so according to my doctor, I am not hypothyroid. I am, I am as I should be. Um, however, I know having done a private um, thyroid test that my T3 shows up within range, but very, very low. T4 is usually in range, but then it would be because I'm being medicated with levothyroxine. So long-term stress, yes. I have lots of genetics that show I've got stress issues going on in my um, inability to, to cope with <clears throat> cortisol and so on, lots of um, SNPs, et cetera. CNM. <laughs> yeah, because CNM is going to go save that bit. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep that in. Yeah, there's definitely CNM going on in there. But even before now, I mean, it has been obviously quite hard for us all with us studying and so on and a pandemic. Um, but long term stress is definitely there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's just just how to kind of get out of all of it now, really. Um, my diet is pretty good. Um, nuts and seeds. Yeah, I'm always eating nuts and seeds. And actually, I seem to be living on dark chocolate at the moment. <laughs> OK, so um, I was fairly accurate with what I said about you from the test. Yeah. Um, interesting. So. The thyroid, I find interesting, and that suggests to me that the thyroid would be optimal if we could tackle the adrenals. So now I've actually spoken to you, and I know I've spoken to you before, but bear in mind, I, I, I speak to so many people each day, I do struggle to remember cases. The thyroid sounds as if it could be optimal. Yes, you're being medicated, but something is driving it to be a little, if you like, skewish. So I think I would come back to adrenals, 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 adrenals. And you've talked about there being the genetic profile and so on. And I do find as a practitioner that when adrenal stress is present, we need to support the body for much longer than we think we would. And I tend to encourage people to take an adrenal support for six months after they think they no longer need it and that's to stop the body reverting the stressor was present you've taken the adrenal support you've done the you know you, you've learned to meditate and, and whatever is your approach 
and that's fine. So you've done the lifestyle thing to support the adrenals. You're taking perhaps an adrenal glandular or maybe um, ashwagandha or, or whatever your preferred method is for supporting the adrenals. I, if people, someone's a non-vegan, I really do like adrenal glandulars, but I absolutely encourage you as practitioners or student practitioners, if you're going to use an adrenal glandular, read the label. It must contain potassium. If you take away anything from today, do remember that potassium is what helps a lot of things get into the cell and the potassium is controlled by the adrenals. So if you take an adrenal product that doesn't have potassium in, think about how it's actually going to work there. I've probably trashed 90% of products on the market. I'll leave you to read labels. And potassium is quite low, isn't it? Potassium is low. So there's lots of things we can do to boost potassium. Um, we can talk about vegetable juices. We can talk about nettles. I am a huge fan of fresh nettles. Um, we're going into the time of year where they're just about going over. But if you are or you do have a clump of nettles anywhere near you, go and hack them down. And in the mild weather, they will reshoot. Take the shoots. The new shoots don't contain, don't sting too badly. If you um, you can cut them with them, wear them rubber gloves and make nettle tea. Really easy. Just stoop a few um, shoots in the hot water. Let them stew for about five to six minutes, and that drink it. Really rich in potassium. You can use them instead of spinach and so on it, when you're making an omelette or something like that. Uh, dried nettle tea theoretically is possible it's just whenever I look at it it always looks so dusty and dry and I want potassium which is very easily destroyed so I would prefer to use fresh personally I, I have to say um it is an acquired taste perhaps somebody said to me yesterday oh, carrot's awful and I was like yes I know it tastes like ditch water but you do get used to it and sweeten it with a bit of natural honey it's not too bad um, so that's really quite a helpful way of doing it. Lots of veg juices, bitter salads with as many meals as you can manage. Um, Ondive, chicory, radicchio, those sorts of leaves are bitter and they stimulate ju vegetable juices and they're also rich in potassium. So the, the, they stimulate digestive juices, sorry. So that's another option. Um, yeah, tackling potassium is going to be key and supporting the adrenals. And I would always say support it for six months longer than you think you need to, to make sure that the change actually holds. And then I came in from that, from the thyroid. The thyroid will, if you take the pressure of it, you'll probably find the thyroid starts to improve. If you can get into London and you're thinking about bone health, there is a super clinic and I just checked its name and it's called Orion. Um, O-R-Y-O-N imaging and they do um, diagnostic scans. Um, I think a gold standard scan on the hip is just under 80 pounds. Um, and I think that that is worth doing. Ideally, I think that a woman should do it in her 30s to 40s, just to check everything's strong. And then I think check it around your 60s, just so that you know if there's anything that you need to work on. Um, rather than waiting until you're 70 or 80 and discovering you have a problem. I think if you can do that in your mid fifties, late fifties, I think that's definitely worth doing. And I'd encourage anyone to do it. And I think I often mention that clinic because it's really, really affordable. I know a lot of the local Bupa hospitals to me charge between four and 600 pounds for a bone scan for a DEXA scan. That's very expensive. If you nip to London and have it done for under a hundred, then that's got to be worth doing. Um, it's a no frills clinic, just worth mentioning. I'm just going to chuck that one out there. Um, blood sugar issues, again, they are being mediated, I think, for you, Sue, by the adrenals. Your body is craving some energy, and that's where, and it's going to get fast energy from making you crave some sugar. Equally, your adrenals being depleted, that's where we're going to be looking at the anti inflammatory hormones they are not going to be optimal. So I wouldn't be surprised to see joint aches and so on coming in. Your comment about um, early menopause. Agony, most days. 
I didn't know that, but I made a guess. Uh, yeah, I'd, honestly, this is such a great test because you kind of go, oh, so joint aches and you've gone, yep, most days. I uh, think Every day, yeah. No, I'm are, just thinking now, I've been sat for an hour thinking, oh, ouch. Yeah. I think that that's, that's linked to um, a number of things that's going to be linked to the adrenals because of the anti-inflammatory hormones not being produced sufficient quantity. Mm. Equally, calcium deposition around the joints. So getting the HCL in, getting that calcium properly used, getting magnesium up, those that'll help as well. Yeah, I've started supplementing magnesium big time as well. And B6, remember magnesium. Oh, yeah, B6. With B6. P, P5, P, B6. But actually, I think I've found a, a B6, um, sorry, a B, the whole of all the Bs I decided, but it has got P, P, P5P in it. Okay, so I'm going to come back on a couple of points there. First of all, um, P5P is the phosphate molecule is stripped off in the gut. So you need optimal digestion for P5P to be really an effective supplementation supplement. It is the form that the body needs um, B6 in. So P5P, great idea. But do remember your digestion has to be optimal because you need the phosphate molecule will be stripped off in the gut and you need the body to rebuild it beyond the gut wall. So you need really good digestion to make sure that that P5P can be properly used. Um, and now I've lost my thread. Where did, where what other form of B6 would you recommend then if somebody hasn't got good digestion? What actually what I would tend to do, and I've no problem with you using the B6, but I would make sure you've got your HCL in, because if you can get the yeah. digestive juices bitter enough or the acidity high enough, the body then sends a signal to the pancreas to release the digestive enzymes. So it's one of those, don't tackle this, but tackle that. It's really actually you need to tackle it all. Right. So, so I know what I was going to say about magnesium. Be sure that you're supplementing enough um, B6 with your magnesium to make sure that's working. So for every five, every hundred milligrams of magnesium, you want to be looking at around 25 of B6. And critically as well, the only time I would vary that is if you're using transdermal. Um, transdermal magnesium, I did some work with Better You. I was very surprised. I actually said to Andy Thomas, the um, MD of Better You, well, when we've proved it's not gonna work, what are you gonna do with all of the test results, the hair analysis? And he said, well, I'm paying you. I'll just bury it, but it'll work. And we did um, supplemented nothing but transdermal magnesium and the difference. I was really surprised. I'm a huge fan of transdermal. That's the only time I don't push. You must take B6 as well. Um, transdermal magnesium, very effective. So best to supplement, if you're going to supplement B6, supplement it when you're taking your um, HCL. Uh, yeah, I would take right, yeah. it. So I've been taking it separate from it. So I would I'll, I'll take it with it. Yeah, all of your supplements, the HCL needs to go in immediately before the meal. And then you can take the supplements during the meal or at the end of the meal. Uh, we're sort of out of time, but I do want to allow some time for questioning. And I Sue, I want you to come back if you've got any more questions as well. Thank you. Um... Oh, so many questions. Like, so I, I have implemented some of the things that uh, we talked about when we when we discussed, but there are quite a few other things that I need to. Do you to want sort. to run by now? Because I'm sure some people will be quite interested. Sorry. Do you, if you want to run some more questions by me now, please do. Yeah, I, I guess um, the question about manganese is, is it, it's like I'm thinking, well, why is that one so so low? And I'm looking at my results and here, well, mang manganese is actually the lowest of my minerals. OK, manganese is often low. The only time that manganese, there is a great study done on some Dutch port, port workers and all of their nutrients were extremely low except for manganese. And the reason their manganese was great was they all drank very, very strong. What I would describe as builder's tea, really strong black tea throughout the day. And that was such a great source of manganese, they didn't have low manganese. But for most people, it is quite low. It does get used up very, very readily. And if you've supplemented zinc at any point, you will have lowered manganese. Um, I don't think this one is taught sufficiently often. If you supplement zinc, you need to supplement manganese. 25 milligrams of 
zinc would require 15 of manganese, otherwise the zinc lowers the manganese. And that is something that I think a lot of people overlook, particularly when we're thinking about building a protocol for ourselves. We might be thinking about um, zinc driving immune system, its role in thyroid, its role in immunity, its role in, produce, in actually creating hydrochloric acid. But we forget that actually just supplementing the zinc will be lowering the manganese. So put the two in together. How much? Um... How much did you say to put in of the manganese? 25 milligrams of um, zinc to 15 of manganese. 15, okay. There's mm. so much to think about. It's, it's, uh, I can't hold all the balls at the moment. It is. I just was going, popping over to grab a couple of products. Um, yeah, it is really, really difficult, I think. Um, yeah, because I've been sort of, uh, I've been hypothyroid for so long. And also, I will come in. Uh, and, you know, cellularly hypothyroid. I, I haven't, as far as the GP is concerned, but I have been that in that state for so many years that, that actually it's, it's become a it's real. It's become your normal. Well, it is, but it's, it's become my normal. I mean, I, I am pretty much exhausted most of the time I get I drag myself out of bed most days and um and I, I as you say I function because I eat well yeah no absolutely and I think some of this is tied to the adrenals and this is where I come back to once you start talking to people you start to nail down okay where is the priority so when I did it just generally before we chatted I covered everything talking to you I'm nailing down we've really got to get the sodium and potassium up we've really mm. got to support the adrenals that's going to be totally key for you moving mm. on mm. Um, adrenal support adrenal support and the adrenals take longer in many ways they are actually quite frustrating because they do take a while to um to make you feel better it, it, that, that one's not the magic fix but I think adrenal support adrenal support adrenal support and yeah. here with the adrenals there are things that you can do aside from just taking an adrenal glandular or herb that will support them think about um correct bedtimes think about correct getting up times making those consistent think about whether or not you can meditate or using guiding meditations if one of those would appeal to you thinking about hydration and sleep. Very often, I think if we haven't dealt with the basics of clean air, sleep and water, then actually whatever we do on top of that becomes window dressing. We need the basics in there too. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I've been gluten-free for quite some time now and mm -hmm. I still have raging TPO. I mean, it's, it's off the scale. It's a thousand plus. And the only thing I can think of is it's my adrenals that's driving it. Exactly what I was going to say. I think it's, and looking at your test results, I'd say it's adrenals are driving it. Mm. So yeah, one more supplement to buy, which is an adrenal support with potassium. <laughs> Absolutely. If, yeah. Not quite rattling yet. <laughs> um, mineral if I could jump up and down, if I had the energy to jump up and down, I probably would rattle. <laughs> mineral check, do a couple of adrenal supports. Um, I've spoke generically rather than talking about products that we sell here, because um, I feel that when I'm doing these talks, if I go generic, it helps you understand rather than me just saying use X product. But if I was going for an adrenal support, there are a couple I would think about. There are three I particularly like. We do a vegan one called Aden Complex, A-D-E-N. That's a really great product. It uses herbs to support the adrenals and it also has sodium phosphate in it. And that's super at getting calcium properly utilized. So love that product. Um, I started importing it here at Mineral Check because I was given a, a POTS trial and I actually got a normal thyroid reading on it for me personally. And I was like, oh, that's interesting first pot in and my thyroid's normalizing so I gave a couple of pots to practitioners and said try it see what you think they both loved it so we started importing it here we also do um, a product called adrenal complex um, so that's fairly obvious it's to support the adrenals it has um, adrenal glandular in it and um, the synergistic nutrients so it does contain potassium and both of those products are available from the natural dispensary as well as direct from us 
Um, and then another one that I quite like if um, for some reason I can't use those two products with someone, I, I might use a herb like ashwagandha. Yeah, I've been supplementing ashwagandha for a very long time. In which case, Sue, I would say change it. Um, it's not doing enough for your adrenals. Switch yeah. out to one of something else. It was absolutely mind blowing when I first used it. In fact, I think it was instrumental in my final burnout because within two days of me starting to take ashwagandha, I felt like, oh, I'm back online again. And so instead of changing my lifestyle, I'm talking five years ago, instead of changing my lifestyle, I just upped, upped the energy again. So for me, I always laughingly describe it as being something like putting um, rocket fuel into a burnout old banger. Yeah. Basically, it was some point or other, it was just going to crash and, and, it, and it was going to end up in an awful mess. And sure enough, six months later, it did. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah. And I think that's why I came in with with the adrenals. You do need to be mindful that it's adrenal support that you're doing. And therefore, you're looking at what else can you do to support the adrenals rather than taking product that props you up and allows you co to continue on the unhealthy trajectory you're on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is why I don't think, you know, when you're working with clients, so taking myself out of the equation here, the learning for me is when you're working with somebody who has obvious adrenal issues and you kind of look and go, well, there's some behaviours that need to change here, is putting in all those supplements and giving them back the energy before you've changed some of the behaviours I'd question whether or not that's actually a good way to go. I know you've got to sort of, as practitioners, we've got to give our clients something which makes them feel like, oh, well, something I'm doing here is working. I feel a bit better. But when you're working with people with chronic fatigue and um, ME and burnout and stress and thyroid and so on, there is so much that needs to change in terms of changing their behaviors that if you don't change that they're just going to be back at it and and they'll do what the why what i did which was burn myself out even bigger i think that's such an interesting observation because i think the other flip side of that is if you don't give them the energy via supplementation they can't make the changes mm. because they don't have the energy yeah. so I think the two do need to be done in tandem yeah definitely does anyone else have any question any more questions No, but I'd just like to say thank you. That was really interesting. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> okay, my email is karen at mineralcheck.com. If you do think of anything and you want to email me, please do. When I spoke through and talked through the ratios, I um, went through how I understand them and I have a great handout which I'm happy to share with you so if you drop me an email I'm happy to share the handout with you I did have a slide because I put it up on um uh, on talkbook but I, I can't remember what I haven't got the slide on here that due to the chaos when I started this morning I just grabbed a presentation and, and used that rather than the one I meant to so I, I'm a little bit disorganized for which I do apologize but if you want to email me, karen at mineralcheck.com, I'm happy to share with you a handout which explains all of the ratios that I've talked through and gives you, if you like, it's just a great crib sheet for quickly understanding them. So drop me an email and I will pop that back to you. Lovely to talk to you all or, or to spend some time with you today. And I hope you will find that helpful. Yeah, thank you, Karen. Thank you it's much. great. Yes, thank you so much. That was really interesting.